Because I know you ain't told me nothing. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, now we got about 15 minutes to go. And I just started out something. And then, uh, uh, when the tenor came in, and then after came with uh, what's the name of this, I don't know if the dick is on my tenor. Uh, uh, like 10 minutes to 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock, yeah, it's like that. And, and fortunately, the wrist fell. And, uh, that's really actually how the one o'clock jump was born. Kansas City and the Southwestern swing style had forged its place in American music by the late 30s. The Basie Orchestra was hot property touring never ceased. Continuous one-night stands produced tired musicians. Lester had his own way of dealing with fatigue. Lester and Buck always sat in the back of the bus where the engine was. Of course, they could light up some pot and you couldn't smell it. <laughs> And they used to always ask me for my hat. I kept the hat up there. And in that hat band, I'd have seven or eight sticks of pot. And they would want to take my hat to try it on. That hat couldn't fit that head, the head was too big. But they'd come in and tell me the hat sick. The drop of a hat. Another time, uh, uh, we were playing in, I think it was Atlanta. And we used to kind of get on prayer. They said, Fred, you should get, you, should, you know, you should buy you some new suits because these suits he, he was wearing was threadbare and they were, they were, we all were poor because we were making $14 a week in Kansas City. So Fred really didn't want to buy, he didn't feel like buying any new suits. So anyway, one day he went down and bought six new suits and we were playing in Atlanta, Georgia <coughs> and Fred had all his suits lined up so pretty in, in the dressing room. We were down on stage playing and when we got through we came back up to the dressing room somebody had come in the window and stole all the pants to present the suit just left the, the coat there so he raved he raved and raved had he raved so much hell about this all he had was coats no pants <laughs> We always had people laughing like crazy. He was a real comedian. Fred was a real comedian. His nickname for, for Count Basie was Groundhog. <laughs> and he's the only one that could ever dare say it. But he didn't usually say it out loud so the others could hear. And in more elegant surroundings, Groundhog became the holy man. Trumpeter Harry Edison was sweet. Jimmy Rushing was Mr. Five by Five. He had his own language, of course. I mean, that was, uh, that was not patentable, but there was nobody else talked like Lester. Nobody else thought like Lester. Lester had a way of speaking the English language like nobody else. He had names for everything. Like the police became Bob Crosby or the Fuzz. I think most of those terms started with him. And Joe Jones. Joe Jones picked up a lot from Lester, too. When we talked, nobody knew what we were talking about. Nobody understood us when we were together. When we talked, you stayed out of it. Because you didn't know what we were talking about. Because nine times out of ten, we didn't know what we were talking about ourselves. 
but we understood one another. And Lester's term for a fat lady would be uh, Lottie Dottie, which meant you can you can touch us if you want, all ass and nobody. That was his way of expressing what a fat lady looked like. And someone came in. And Fred says, I feel a draft. Who opened the windows? I feel a draft. And then he'd look at the individual, he would call them an orange tucker, a tummy tucker. If he called you an orange tucker, that meant you were a bad guy. Lester was a living, walking poet. He was more creative about this than others. And he had the capacity to coin expressions and use terms which others later picked up. So many of the terms that we use today, do you dig? And that's cool, are attributed to Lester Young. Lester Young's style of speech was as unique as his musical style, a style which was beginning to impel other younger musicians. But it wasn't just his tenor playing they were listening to, for his sensitivity and unique phrasing came through on the clarinet as well. And so Benny was playing uh, his clarinet, and Lester had a beat-up old metal clarinet. And uh, Benny listened, first of all, to Lester on tenor. And he said, my God, John, I'd never heard a tenor. He said, that's the way I play. And, and he said, kept, Benny didn't play that well on tenor. But, I mean, it, it, it sounds like an aloe, said Benny. I said, it doesn't really. It sounds like a C melody, but still. Uh, so, uh, so, Benny was so impressed with Fred that he gave him his Selma clarinet on the spot. When Benny Goodman gave Lester a clarinet, Lester had never played clarinet before, but it's similar to, to tenor. So he, he took Benny's clarinet and, and played just beautifully on it. Uh, I think blue and sentimental for Buster playing the clarinet. Uncle Bubba played the clarinet on that great blue and sentimental solo that Herschel did. And any time I want to show somebody how good Perez was on the clarinet, I play that. Nineteen thirty-eight saw the parting of the ways between the Basie organization and Lady Day in a management dispute. It happened just prior to one of the greatest concerts in jazz history. Tonight is old boss Carl Basie for the first time since Kansas City. Joined together were musical minds from all walks of Afro-American life. Advertised as the Spirituals to Swing, an evening of American Negro music, the concert was designed by John Hammond. And, uh, as said John Hammond, had all so many spiritual singers then it went into blues singers, and then it went into jazz. The Spirituals to Swing featured the Basie Orchestra and One O'Clock Jump. The band then broke into smaller groups, Basie's Blue Five and the Kansas City Six. On this night, the Kansas City spirit was ever-present. A year later, on Christmas Eve 1939, the Spirituals to Swing returned like the preceding year, the concert was a great success, with the Basie Orchestra the featured main event. Also booked for the evening's performance was the Benny Goodman Orchestra. Goodman allowed his guitarist to sit in for a couple of numbers with the members of the Basie group. The guitarist was Charlie Christian. 
Christian and Young were featured in the few tunes that evening. Contractual problems deprived future generations the beauty of these two jazz masters together. <laughs> At Carnegie Hall, the Basie Band evinced their greatest quality, versatility. Often described as many bands within one band, the Basieites showed that technique wasn't necessarily the greatest virtue of jazz. Creativity, spontaneity, the feeling of the moment, that was jazz. Shortly after the Spirituals to Swing concert, the band was playing at the Crystal Ballroom in Hartford, Connecticut. As he stood the solo, Herschel Evans collapsed. He was taken to a hospital in New York, where it was learned that Evans had suffered a heart attack at the age of 30. Now, I'm, I'm going to get him out of the hotel that night, he said. He needed a bellhop, and I really put him in the cab and get him in there, and I've never seen a man so sick. And about 10 o'clock, and about 1 o'clock that, that morning, Called from hospital that he had passed. He, he didn't know nothing. After uh, Herschel Evans died, I mean, they were really good friends, the best of friends. But after Herschel died, something really uh, my dad was so hurt. It was like he left. You know, like, part of him left with Herschel. When we got up on the band and play, like a duo, <laughs> you know, but I mean, it's coming through these instruments, you know. He was a nice person. I was the last one to see him die. When Herschel Evans died, and they were such close friends, he was, he felt a little lost. And he talked to Mr. Basie. And he explained that he thought maybe it was time for him to move on and try it on his own for a while and see what happened. Because I know we were at the studio with everybody. I was in right there at the time. And everybody's waiting for Les to show up. We we're all ready to record, except Res hadn't come yet. And we waited and waited a couple of hours, so finally, Basin called up the Woodside and got Pres on the phone. And he still was home. He hadn't started to leave. Basin said, what the hell are you doing home? And Pres was supposed to have said, well, man, you know, I don't make, I don't record on the 13th. And it was the 13th, so he didn't show. He said we didn't have him. We didn't care much for black cats, the four-legged kind. <laughs> and he didn't feel really comfortable playing on Friday the 13th, but that wasn't the reason he left. Most likely, Herschel Evans' death and musical stagnancy both led to Lester's departure. He left for Los Angeles to form a small group with his brother Lee. Uh, Perez made a mistake, you know. He, he wasn't making terribly much money with Basie, it's true. But uh, Perez got uh, talked into forming his own band with his brother Lee. Of course I'm pretty. Of course I'm pretty. <laughs> but I think that that was the best small band ever. Now, shoot, get somebody, you know, we'll say, well, how about John Kirby? How about, you know, uh, how about him? <laughs> you know, because this was the band. And it's just unfortunate that it didn't uh, stay around for a long period of time because it really had every element. It looked good, the all gentlemen, and the musicianship was just outstanding. Capri on La Cienega and Pico here in here in town. And I think Lester just left Basie and came out to join our band. The main thing I remember about it is that the union wouldn't let him work right away. He had to 
he presented as an act for about six months, I guess. The Lee and Lester Young Band 